It is the middle of June on Astarte Farm, and the crew have been working long and hard through some crazy hot and crazy cold weather. So much happens on a single day that most of the video I've shot in the last three weeks looks out of date almost immediately. Harvesting, washing, and packing are taking more and more time each week. Planting is continuing apace, and any weeds that can find an open spot on earth are poking their heads up and planning to set seed. The wash house is really starting to hum. From the triple wash system for lettuces to the new bubbler that takes off a lot of field soil from the fresh green garlic before it gets a final high pressure spray. Draining racks help stage the produce before it's packed in boxes and placed in the cooler. In addition to supplying our new Astarte Farm CSA, we are selling produce to River Valley Market and various local chefs. Two important outlets for us are the food donations we can make to the Pioneer Valley Workers Center and the Amherst Survival Center. Out in High Tunnel 1 we can see some fine examples of both relay cropping and companion cropping. Relay cropping requires flexible planning so that when a crop is ready to be harvested there is another crop ready to be transplanted quickly into the same ground. This helps preserve the existing fungal activity around the plant roots that is so vital to our growing process. You can see our early tomatoes already transplanted into several lettuce beds. When the lettuce is cut for harvest, the plant essentially dies, but instead of simply melding back into the soil, there is another living root system for all of those microorganisms to colonize. When using these techniques, we see relatively little transplant shock, probably due to both the bed canopying, which cools the soil and helps preserve moisture, and the preservation of our active soil food web. A quick peek into the blueberry patch shows a good fruit set thanks to our strong pollinator habitat program. These green berries will begin to show some blue color before July rolls around. And while the bird netting is poised for complete avian exclusion, we still have not successfully solved the cranberry fruitworm problem. Their webs that enclose whole fruit clusters provide excellent protection from parasitic wasps, and our only nose spray option at this point will be to remove the affected fruits. Our CSA U pick pea crop is putting on a lot of succulent pods. It also appears that some four-footed creature has found the pea patch, so it may be a race between our shareholders and our wildlife to harvest all those peas. Further out in the field, Ellen has let a portion of the Tokyo Bacana crop go to flower in support of our pollinator predator population. It's great to get multiple uses off a single crop. What look like flies feeding on the pollen and nectar in these flowers are actually small, harmless to humans, predatory wasps. Some of them look like miniature bees and as kids we used to call them sweat bees due to their fondness for the perspiration on our forearms. They could give a little pinch if squeezed inside an elbow but think what they must do to a tiny caterpillar. Ellen and Amelia have been experimenting with different methods of bed prep this spring and here's a shot of an early arugula bed after two days of clear plastic solarization. It is almost frighteningly effective on a delicate crop like arugula and this method can also be useful for eliminating spring flushes of annual grasses. Any perennial weeds or grasses with extensive root systems can take much longer to kill completely. Garlic scapes are in season. Beyond the single bed of early fresh garlic from one of our high tunnels, these flowering tops with their peculiar pig's tail curl are the first taste after garlic's long growing season, and we begin to harvest them almost a month before the field garlic is ready to pull. 
They make a great base for a green garlic pesto in a food processor. The tender parts can be chopped into a stir fry. They can be sautéed in a little butter. Some folks even like them in flower bouquets. Floating row covers have gotten a lot of use this spring, primarily to limit rabbit and groundhog grazing on our spring greens. It works well for insects also, but heat can build up quickly under them, particularly when the sun is so high in the sky and we have to endure another early season heat wave. The tomatoes aren't complaining, and this is just a small portion of the crop that is already in the ground. At the far end of the field, you can see what six weeks under a silage tarp has done to the winter rye cover crop. Because of the high moisture levels under the tarp, the rye's dense root system has started to break down nicely. This allows much easier winter squash and pumpkin transplanting, and has kept the microscopic soil life active while we wait for the weather to settle down. The final shot shows this area mulched heavily with straw and row cover installed to protect the plants until they begin to flower. Gosh, I'm sure I missed a lot with the whole crew working as quick as they can to bring the farm into full productivity. I'll keep trying, but please feel free to ask questions. I will respond. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe and gosh, go ahead and hit like while you're there. Catch you next time.